Melissa Harrison here with the Media Project podcast. Our executive director, Paul Gladder, is in the studio, as well as a colleague of his, somebody he worked with in Germany, Michael Scott Moore, who is an American novelist, a journalist. He's written about surfing and has the latest book about being taken captive in Somalia. The book is titled The Desert and the Sea, 977 Days Captive on the Somali Pirate Coast. Michael, thank you for joining us. Welcome to our podcast. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I think it might be helpful to listeners to hear some background. And so, um, as you noted, you know, Michael is a novelist, and he wrote one of the an early book about surfing, a mm-hmm. travel book about surfing. And um, I was a, a fellow at Der Spiegel Online in 2012, which is when I met Michael. He'd been working there a, lo- a much longer period of time. It had to be 2011. Or 2011. That's I disappeared right. in 2012. That's right. 2011. That's right. Thank you. Um, so, so I recall you, you'd been reporting on Somalia, and you got a grant of some kind. And tell us about that and how it took you uh, on a journey to Somalia. Yeah, I mean, I, from working at Spiegel Online um, in the newsroom at first, uh, I learned about Somali piracy because I was covering uh, from a distance the stories that were happening off the coast. And so I, I became interested in, in Somali piracy just from that, you know. Um, at the same time, I had been writing a book, which was a travel book, also about surfing, but also about the history of certain countries where surfing has taken hold, including Cuba and Morocco, which have uh, sort of these colorful pirate histories. And it occurred to me that nobody was putting the Somali pirate problem, which was a new pirate problem, um, on the on the face of the earth over the last two centuries. Before that, there had been very little piracy. Um, no one was putting that out outbreak of piracy into historical context. And I had some of that historical context in my head while I was writing these news stories. And so I became very interested in um, Somali piracy as a as a phenomenon. Uh, but still, I wasn't in the mood to go to Somalia quite until a trial of 10 Somali pirates came to Germany. Um, 10 guys tried to capture a German cargo ship and got tried in Hamburg. They got, got captured and, um, and brought before the court. It was the first trial of pirates on German soil in over four centuries. So that was catnip to me. Uh, So I followed the trial for Spiegel um, for almost a year. And that's when you and I knew each other. That was 2011. And during that period, I found ways into central Somalia and ways to go there, I thought, safely. I would like to open, if we could, the book and have you actually read a few pages. I think that the the second... Uh, set of pages there on piracy. You just start talking about the the broader issue that you were interested in, the history of piracy, um, and you know uh, I'll say that I you know I heard Michael talk with, with surf, the surfing community at a surf shop actually in Brooklyn about his this latest book and his experience, and um, and it was a pleasure to hear his voice again and see him in person after following his captivity there, uh, being held hostage for 977 days. But as I, and as I listened and then started looking at the book, I was curious about the broader context and the history, and also the question of religion and what someone um, who is in a Muslim majority country that has a lot of you know is in the news a lot, what kind of experience you would have had with religion while there, Michael. So there's a couple of parts of the book I think we might want to talk about and hear from hear you read actually. So let's start with this uh, segment on piracy. Sure. Uh, so, no, you're right. I mean, once I was there, I realized I was in a um, in a context that was not irreligious. I, I would have thought that pirates were not religious before I really met them. And um, while I was a hostage, I was surprised to notice that some of them were par- praying five times a day. Most of them were. And um, that upset me, obviously. So eventually I asked one of the guards about that. And that's what this passage is about. Um, the guard was called... Um, Bashko, and we got along fairly well, but he was also one of the most devout guards. So I asked him finally what his what he thought he was doing as a religious man holding a hostage. Um, and we talked about the economic problems in Somalia. Obviously, it's one of the poorest countries on earth, and some people go hungry, um, not necessarily in that province where I was captured. Uh, things are pretty stable in the central Somali state of Galmudug. Uh, but that's where Bashko started, was um, the problem of, of food. And he said, between him and me, there was no personal animus, he said. But um, but he said, in America, money full. 
Europe, money full. In Somalia, he said, hungry problems. I said, that's true. And I held his eyes. No good, I said. A brutal famine had killed thousands of people in other parts of Somalia in 2011 and 2012, but I couldn't tell whether Bashko was also claiming starvation. Refugees from within Somalia had fled to Galmudug because of the relative prosperity there. America was not always rich, I pointed out. Europe was not always rich. You have to build up, slow, slow, I said, and made a stepwise motion with my hand. We were limited by our failures of language to some pretty crude arguments. We left out the ravages of colonialism in Somalia. We left out the Somali climate and a hundred other complications. Indonesia isn't rich, I went on. It's poor and Muslim, with many Sufis, like Somalia. They don't shoot each other, I said. By and large, that was true. They have roads and decent shops. A lot of people don't have cars, um, but they have scooters. You can raise a family in peace, I shrugged. Indonesia is nice. Muslim, said Bashko. Yeah, Muslim good, Bashko said. Sure. Bashko was surprised to hear such a thing from me. So far I'd been treated like a prisoner of a vague but global war, a captive from a distant sub-clan that by definition hated Muslims. I did not hate Muslims, but now I had a chance to ask a question that had baffled me for most of the year. Bashko, I said, you are a Muslim. Yes, but you are also a thief. I bumped my fingers together, which by now was a comprehensible gesture for us. No same-same, I said, meaning these things don't fit together. A smile crept over his face as my intention dawned. He laughed and rattled a translation to his friends. Hmm, said Isa, another pirate guard. Bashko straightened up in his chair and tapped his chest. I am a Muslim, he said, but I am also a thief. Why? Because in Somalia, hungry problem. As if Allah could outlaw thievery but make an exception for pirates. It's okay, guys, you're poor, I imagined Allah saying. Once you steal enough money, you can be good Muslims. I don't think Islam works like that, I said. Bashko had a spry combative mind, so the theological problem bothered him for the next two weeks. We returned to it one morning while I l l ate my dawn ration of beans. He'd been lazy about cooking them, and I had threatened a hunger strike. He'd lost our little showdown and delivered the bowl with ill grace, like a man feeding a dog. He watched me eat with fervid, resentful eyes, and finally said, Michael. What? I said. Muslim, he said, and smiled wickedly. No chum-chum, no problem. In other words... A Muslim who doesn't eat won't have any problems. Oh, I said. He said, Christian, no chum-chum, problem full. In other words, a Christian who doesn't eat makes all kinds of problems. I wiped my fingers clean with a scrap of toilet paper. I had great stoic reserves, but I was not about to go hungry just to make life easier for a bunch of lazy pirates. Bashko, I said in my, our mutual language. Last week you said a Muslim could be a pirate because of the hunger problem. He nodded. Now you say a good Muslim has to bear up under hunger. In pidgin, Muslim no chum chum, Muslim no problem. Because Islam, I said. He nodded. I bounced my fingers again. No, same, same. These points are different. Bashko laughed, and then laughed a bit more and held up his thumb. I'd gotten him. Good, he said, and translated my response to the other guards. This time it sparked a discussion. I had cr criticized a faith I saw in action five times a day. Abdul, an effeminate-looking guard, gave the most fervent defense. He'd signed on to watch me uh, when he learned that a foreigner had been kidnapped, he said. He wasn't a pirate. He was just doing the good Muslim work of protecting an infidel in a hostile place. He went on. Did I think the boss Garfanji was a Muslim? The boss Ali Touré? The boss Ali Dulé? <clears throat> had I ever seen them read the Koran? Uh-uh, he answered himself with a wag of the finger. Those men, he said, were the real kufar the real infidels. I had gleaned this argument already. It was possible that some of my guards had never hijacked a ship, but they'd guarded me since the start of the year, so they had the trust of those infidel bosses. Bashko came around to the real justification later the same day. He acted sober and earnest while we sat, in alo sat alone in the hot room, and he said, the Koran called for struggle against the infidel, quote-unquote, Thieving from non-Muslims, therefore, was not theft. What? I said. Jews, Christians, Buddhists, he said, okay to steal from them. Muslim? No. But there were four Muslims on the ship, uh, the Naham Three, where I was also held hostage. I told him. Uh, yes, he sat cross-legged and upright, trying to seem very correct in his manner. 
we must not take from Muslim families, he said, taking, from, taking ransom from the ship owners or foreign governments. That was different. But if the bosses took ransom from a Muslim family, Bashko said, that would be theft, according to his reading of the Quran. What about the captain of the ship, I said. He was shot dead. Christian, Bashko blurted, uh, but he was t Taiwanese. Buddhist, I imagine. I held Bashko's eyes. Does the Quran say that you can kill non-Muslims? Again, I wanted a long and detailed interview with Bashko. I wished intensely for a translator, but in our, in our pigeon mix of English and Somali, we could only speak in broad terms. No, he said, and turned pious again. Allah speak, all life is good. This idea that all life was sacred under Allah separated pirates from al-Shabaab, said Bashko. In other words, pirates were Sufi, but the al-Shabaab, who were the Wahhabists, an al-Qaeda-aligned group in Somalia, had interpreted the relevant Quranic verses as a call to lethal jihad. Sufi pirates had a different idea. Under Allah, I said, it's okay to steal from other faiths? Quran speak, yes, he, he answered, and, implied, and smiled to imply that there was nothing he could do. The book said so, and the book outranked us both. One Quranic verse, 9-5, a so-called verse of the sword, uh, does mention abduction of other people. When the sacred months are over, it reads, slay the idolaters, which means the infidels, wherever you find them. Arrest them, besiege them, lie in ambush everywhere for them. If they repent and take to prayer and render the alms levy, allow them to go their way. God is forgiving and merciful, says the verse. The alms levy is a tax for the poor. I could just see how a pirate from one of the world's most destitute countries might consider a ransom from the outside world an alm alms levy. And in the sealed-off deserts of Somalia, the spiritual notion that a total stranger might have aspects of the sacred was no use whatsoever. I remembered a Somali phrase from the trial in Hamburg, kuf an lu oyen, excuse my pronunciation, meaning those for whom we don't cry. It was a reference to minorities or strangers within Somalia, but from outside a traditional alliance of clans, in other words, people that you have no sympathy for. For the world of infidels sliding past the country's beaches on freighters full of expensive cargo, there was little room for compassion and no transcendent love. The glories of Sufism had failed to lift these men out of tribalism. In that sense, they were no better than fundamentalists. They knew the letter of their religion and little else. But Bashko would have taken it as a mortal insult to hear that he was no Muslim. He belonged to a vast pool of undereducated believers with a xenophobia made sharper, not milder, by the Quran. It's a funny religion, Bashko, I said after a while. Hmm. You know, <clears throat> the title of the book, The Desert and the Sea, I've learned it has some kind of religious meaning and relates to that passage a bit, perhaps, That's right. as well. So t could you explain what, how you got to that title? Yeah, sure. So the, on the surface, the desert and the sea is just about the fact that I was held on land and also on the water because they put me on a ship. Um, which is mentioned in that passage. But um, the other dimension is it's contained in a paragraph that I use as an epigraph at the beginning of the book by Richard Kapuscinski, um, a Polish correspondent who went all over the world but spent a lot of time actually in East Africa. And when he was in Al Algeria, I think, um, he noticed two extremes of Islam, the very fundamentalist and intolerant version, which he called the Islam of the desert, which belonged to the tribes that never saw the outside world. And then he said there was also an Islam of the sea, which belonged to the merchants and traders who did deal with Europeans and outsiders and infidels. And of course, the Islam of the sea was much milder. And that sort of dichotomy, it's a very crude way to divide uh, divide Islam, but that those two extremes are visible in Somalia. Um, and I take those as a starting point to observe, to, to interpret what I saw. Um, but if you take those two as, a, as rough categories of Islam, in fact, pirates are um, the good guys. Pirates are, are the ones who follow a much milder form of Islam, a sort of Islam of the sea, um, even though they don't see a whole lot of the outside world, as a matter of fact. What was interesting to me is what Boshko told me about his justification for holding somebody hostage, holding an infidel hostage, was based on a very rigid interpretation of this one line in the Quran, which means he was a Sufi, giving me a justification that sounded very fundamentalist. Hmm. And so that that leads to a whole other line of inquiry in the book. 
I think one of my students asked, well, are you religious or did the experience affect your religious uh, views or experience? Yeah, I mean, I definitely fell back on my upbringing and I was raised as a Catholic. One way that I survived was, was by falling back on Christian forgiveness and learning to do that. Um, that was, it took a while, <laughs> but it was an incredible way to ease my mind of these pressures of um, wanting to kill my guards, actually, and, and sometimes also wanting to kill myself. So it turned out to be very important, but just because I fell back on my own religion and background doesn't mean that I think it's better somehow than, than in another tradition. Um, but I'm obviously very critical of the Islam that um, my pirates were carrying around with them. There's an there's an essence of every big religion that um, you can you can reach for. I think um, that actually will help you through a situation like that. Um, and there is an essence, I think, of forgiveness in all the all the big religions. In the class you were sharing, and you describe yourself as continuing to this day to be a lapsed Catholic. And it was a word from the Pope, however, that you heard when you were there that was very encouraging. Tell us about that. So all those things that I just described in the passage were on my mind, but I also had a radio at some point um, late in my captivity. And uh, I happened to, most of the time I listened to the BBC World Service, but sometimes I got the Vatican radio. And one morning I heard a homily by the Pope. Um, and he described with just a very simple image what, what mercy was. And um, he, he said that, um, you know, it was very, very important for me to hear that because I was sitting there stewing in this, these ideas of, of guilt and everything that I'd done wrong, you know, to get myself into this situation. And he said, well, at night you, um, you can see all your sins and shortcomings like the stars. You know, there are lots of stars in the sky. But in the morning, the sun comes up and banishes the sky stars with its glory and he said the mercy of God was like that and that was such a simple pithy image you know and it was extremely powerful and it gave me this idea that um, um, one way out of this mental maze was to forgive the most immediate people around me which meant my guards and once I started to do that and once I started to think in that direction I didn't wake up angry every morning and I didn't wake up wondering if I should kill myself um, or wondering if I should kill them so it, that notion brought me back from that, the brink of suicide, I think. And um, I think it's one essential reason why I made it out alive. Hmm. You know, we talked earlier at, with the class again. Um, you know, when Michael first was taken captive, I recall in Germany, the, the, the friend circles, we, everybody first wanted to make sure he was safe physically. Mm -hmm. But then when, once that was assured... It, there, I think there, obviously there was a huge sense of dread for him, but also everybody wondering what was, uh, we knew he was safe physically, mm -hmm. but when is he going to get out? And we yeah. started hearing about the, the, the dollar figures. And uh, uh, I told, we had, a, we had a poker group in, in, in Berlin yeah. with other journalists every once a month usually. And mm -hmm. so we sometimes kept an empty chair for Michael. <laughs> That's so sweet. And yeah. we would always get the update during the poker game mm -hmm. and just kind of talk, have time to talk about it. But... Um, you know this this element of so you got to read the book i think to to learn all of what a person goes through 977 days of captivity and also to find out how the situations resolved but what should what should listeners uh, know about how how you're here today how it was resolved i th i think that's that's one important thing was um being able to rearrange my my head while i was there um, the other important thing, obviously, is that um, my mom scraped together a ransom. So she was on the phone negotiating with the pirates. So in that sense, she's a, the complete heroine of this story. Um, she, but she started a fund for my ransom, which came from family and friends and various magazines I'd worked for and a few institutions in the U.S. and Germany. And so uh, that is the reason I'm free. Um, but... I have to say that it's the pirates that blinked. We did not come up to their price. <laughs> um, the pirates first demanded $20 million, um, and in the end they came down from a still outrageous demand to about $1.6 million, and that's what was paid. Hmm. We have issues in our world of human trafficking and slavery and captivity that are not new, but and they, and they don't seem to go away. And yeah. so you talked a bit about what, what you learned um, before, during, and after. Well, one thing that was 
uh, really enlightening was that um, was to come home and then listen to some of the pro some of the stories of people coming across the Mediterranean to to Europe. You know, some of them were Somalis, um, and in some cases, I think my pirates wanted to be some of them. Um, I'm not sure any of them did uh, by that method, but when I listened to some of those stories, I realized that they were getting uh, some migrants were coming across and being detained by men in SUVs with Kalashnikovs who were feeding them very food very similar to what I ate, which told me that I was not just a hostage, um, I was also a trafficked person. Um, so I belonged to that big shadow economy that um, has always gone on in, in trafficking people. Um, in other words, they were holding my flesh for money. And so uh, that was a really important realization. And I'm not sure I had that on my mind while I was there. You also talk about in the book, um, you know, the, the, there's a history, of course, in Morocco of mm -hmm. sort of Islam and Christian um, thievery on the open seas and, oh, and, yeah. and, and, and um, captivity, but also something I didn't really know, which was that even colonial America had a penchant for yeah. um, piracy, right? Sure. And that this is the stuff that I wanted to write about when I first went to Somalia. Um, it comes into the book now. Um, as a tangent, but I, I was trying to put Somali piracy into historical context when I first went to Somalia. And that meant um, some history on the Barbary Coast. Like you mentioned, off North Africa, they, there was um, a long, you know, several centuries long phase of Muslim piracy off the coast that was countered by Christian piracy from uh, Europe. I mean, there was a definite religious war going on across the Mediterranean. And as it turned out, uh, let's say 300 years ago, um, at the end of the 1600s, beginning in the 1700s, um, there was v a very serious phase of piracy from the, Atlant uh, the Atlantic seaboard. So the American colonies were full of sort of rogue seafarers um, who weren't allowed to work as much as they would, would have liked to because of politics with the crown. So they went out and got money for themselves. And one of the long-distance projects for those um, um, American or British pirates there were no American passports back then, um, was to sail all the way out to the Horn of Africa and sack Muslim ships. So 300 years ago, it was actually American, sea f American colonial seafarers that were um, sacking Muslim ships off the Horn of Africa, you know, mm -hmm. not, not Somali pirates. Mm -hmm. So all these things have to be kept in mind. You mm -hmm. know, there was a, I was surf certainly suffering from a lot of intolerance in Somalia, mm -hmm. um, but 300 years ago it was... Um, the things were reversed. And my last question, too, is back to that opening uh, point we, we touched on about Indonesia and how, you know, we look at all world religions have spectrums of tolerance and intolerance, frankly. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, Indonesia is a place w where we spend time as a media project. Um, and, and it's very interesting that there's a elements of tolerance, that there's a space for tolerance there, even mm -hmm. for serious Muslims, right? Yeah. Um, and, you know, any insights as to a place like Somalia? Or is there hope? Do you, do you sense any hope that one day um, they could be more like Indonesia, people like Bashko, or, or is it pretty, well, sure. pretty bleak the, for you to think there's, that way? There's always hope, but at the moment there's so much corruption in Somalia that um, even with a new government, which they've had in the meantime since I got out, a slightly more um, legitimate government with with a serious election behind it, um, the government doesn't have that much power over the provinces. It's going to be a while before Somalia is stable enough to have the kind of um, economy that Indonesia has. But I found it completely fascinating that in Indonesia, the, the brand of Sufism is the same. So Indonesia and Somalia, in some sense, are both on the frontiers of the Muslim world. Um, and so it's very common to find Sufism out on those fringes. Um, and in fact, they wear the same kind of sarongs. You know, they wear, they dress similarly, um, and they they follow more or less the same traditions um, as a as a broad population. And then there are divisions within it. Um, and there's certainly in, in Indonesia. I've even talked to them. There are certainly near Al Qaeda aligned people. You know, who are less tolerant. Mm -hmm. um, but as a rule, the, the Indonesians are really wonderfully open. Yeah, and I find it so fascinating too the the fact that when a journalist becomes the story, mm -hmm. right? You're there to cover a story, and then you find yourself for 977 days 
part of the story in a way. And now even in class, you were referring to as you you don't want to be known or enjoy being known just as the hostage. Right. This has become very much a part of your identity. Um, what do you hope moving forward? Um, what do you foresee and what are some goals for you as a journalist as you continue to promote? Obviously, the book is newly released. So mm -hmm. this is, of course, part of what you're sharing. But what do you hope and, and see for your future in the next year, couple of years as, as you move forward? Well, I'm not sure, but I, it is one project for the rest of my life to get captured by pirates off my gravestone. Um, <laughs> I, I'm going to work on, you, you know, different books, obviously, in the, in the next few years. But the first one that I'm working on is a novel that I started in Somalia. So it's already got that link, but it has nothing to do with pirates and nothing to do with um, Somalis in particular. Each of my three books is very different. Um, they're they're um, different from one another, but one thing they have in common um, is, first of all, an interest in the ocean. And uh, another, the other thing, maybe even related, um, is an obsession with freedom. I c couldn't get away from it with this book, obviously, but um, with the, my first novel and also the book about surfing, freedom is inherent in the story that I had to tell. So if I think about it le at that level, then I have a lot of latitude. <laughs> Well, to put a plug into listeners to to uh, you know pick up a copy of De the desert and, and the sea, um, and if you love surfing, pick up a copy of Sweetness and Blood if you can <laughs> get your hands on one, right? Yeah, for and, sure. Thank you. And your blog, uh, where should they also follow your writing and your career? Uh, my website Mike? is at radiofreemike.net. dot net, mm -hmm. um, and yeah, there's a blog there, but also some pages just about uh, what I'm up to and and about the books. And maybe we'll see this. Uh, on, on the big screen one day, perhaps. And we'll see, like. yeah. Yeah. Great. Well, thanks so much for joining us today. Terrific. Thanks, Paul.